Hare Krishna. Jai. Jai Krishna book reading to Srila Prabhupada. We'd like to welcome everyone to our Sunday Krishna book reading to Srila Prabhupada here in his sacred Vrindavan room. And for everyone online, you can follow along with the subtitles. It makes it very easy to be able to hear Krishna book. So as we always do, let us offer our respectful obeisances to Srila Prabhupada and to each other. Nama Om Vishnu Vidaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamanitti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharane Nirvasesha Sanyavadi Paskachade Shatarane And to each other, Vanchakalpadrubhyas Cha Kripa Sindhu Bhyeva Cha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha So we're on chapter 64. <clears throat> you can take your Krishna books out. Turn to chapter 64, the story of King Nigra. Once the family members of Lord Krishna, such as Shamba, Pradumna, Charu, Banu, and Gada, all princes of the Yadu dynasty, went for a long picnic in the forest near Dwarka. In the course of their excursion, all of them became thirsty, and so they tried to find out where water was available in the forest. When they approached a well, they found no water in it, but on the contrary, within the well was a wonderful living entity. It was a large lizard, and all of them were astonished to see such a wonderful animal. They could understand that the animal was trapped and could not escape by its own effort. So out of compassion, they tried to take the large lizard out of the well. Unfortunately, they could not get the lizard out, even though they tried to do so in many ways. When the princess returned home, their story was narrated before Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is a friend of all living entity. Therefore, after hearing appeal from his sons, his personal went to well and easily got the great lizard out simply by extending his left hand. Immediately upon being touched by the hand of Lord Krishna, the great lizard gave up its lizard shape and appeared as beautiful demigod and inhabits of heavenly planets. His complex was glittering like mortal gold. He was decorated with fine garments and he wore costly ornaments around his neck. How the demigod had been obliged to accept the body of a lizard was not a secret to Lord Krishna, but still for others' information, the Lord inquired, My dear fortunate demigod, now I see that your body is so beautiful and lustrous. Who are you? We can guess that you are one of the best demigods in the heavenly planets. All good fortune to you. I think that you are not meant to be in this situation. It must be due to the results of your past activities that you were put into the species of a lizard life. Still, I want to hear from you how you were put into this position. If you think that you can disclose the secret, then please tell us your identity. Actually, the slash lizard was King Ni Nigra, and when questioned by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he immediately bowed down before, before the Lord touching to the ground the helmet on his head, which was as dazzling as the sunshine. In this way he first offered his respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Lord. He then said, My dear Lord, I am King Nigar, the son of King Ikshvaku. If you have never ever taken account of all charitably disposed men, I am sure you must have heard my name. My Lord, you are the Supreme Witness. You are aware of every bit of work done by the living entities. 
past, present and future. Nothing can be hidden from your eternal cognizance. Still you have ordered me to explain my history and I shall therefore narrate the full story. King Nirga proceeded to narrate the history of his degradation caused by his Karam Kanda activities. He said that he had been very charitably disposed and had given away so many cows that the total was equal to the number of particles of dust on the earth. Stars in the sky or drops of water in the in a rainfall. According to the Vedic ritualistic ceremonies, a man who is charitably disposed is recommended to give cows to the Brahmanas. From King Nirigas statement, it appears that he followed this principle earnestly. However, as a result of, of a slight discrepancy, he was forced to take birth as a lizard. Therefore, it is recommended by the Lord in the Bhagavad Gita that one who is charitably disposed and desires to derive the benefit of his charity should offer his gifts to please Krishna. To give charity means to perform pious activities by which one may be elevated to the higher planetary systems. But promotion to the heavenly planets is no guarantee that one will never fall down. Rather, the example of King Nriga definitely proves that fruitive activities, even if very pious, cannot give us eternal blissful life. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, the result of work, either pious or impious, is sure to bind a man unless the work is discharged as yajna on behalf of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. King Riga saw, said that the cows he had given in charity were not ordinary cows. Each one was very young and had given birth to only one calf. They were full of milk, very peaceful and healthy. All the cows were purchased with money earned legally. Furthermore, their horns were gold-plated, their hooves were bedecked with silver plating and they were covered with necklaces and with silken wrappers, embroidered with pearls. He stated that these valuable decorated cows had not been given to any worthless persons but had been distributed to first-class brahmanas, whom he had also decorated with nice garments and gold ornaments. The brahmanas were well qualified and since none of them were rich, the family members were always in want for the necessities of life. A real brahmana never hoards money for a luxurious life like the Kshatriyas or the Vaishyas but always keeps himself poverty stricken. Knowing that money diverts the mind to materialistic ways of life. To live in this way is the vow of a qualified brahmana and all of these brahmanas were well situated in that exalted vow. They were well learned in Vedic knowledge. They executed the required austerities and penances in their lives and were liberal, meeting the standard of qualified brahmanas. They were equally friendly to everyone. Above all, they were young and quite fit 
to act as a qualified brahmanas. Besides the cows, they were also given land, gold, houses, horses and elephants. Those who were not married were given wives, maidservants, grain, silver, utensils, garments, jewels, household furniture, chariots, etc. This charity was nicely performed as a sacrifice according to the Vedic rituals. The king also stated that not only, not only had he bestowed gifts upon the brahmanas, but he had performed other pious activities, such as digging wells, planting trees on the roadside, and installing ponds along the highways. The king continued, in spite of all this, unfortunately one of the brahmanas cow that I had given in charity chanced to enter amongst my other cows. Not knowing this, I again gave it in charity to another brahmana. As the cow was being taken away by this brahmana, its former master claimed it as his own, stating, this cow was formerly given to me, so how is it that you are taking it away? Thus there was arguing and fighting between the two brahmanas and they were before me and charged that they, they, and they came before me and charged that I had taken back a cow I had previously given in charity to give something to someone and then, it, then to take it back is considered a great sin especially in dealing with brahmana. When both brahmanas charged the king with the same complaint, he was simply puzzled as to how it, has hap it had happened. Thereafter, with great humility, the king offered each of them 100,000 <coughs> 100, cows in exchange for the one cow that was causing the fight between them. He prayed to them that he was their servant and that there had been some mistake. Thus, in order to rectify it, he prayed that they be very kind upon him and accept his offer in exchange for the cow. The king fervently appealed to the brahmanas not to cause his downfall into the hell because of this mistake. A brahmana's pro property is called Brahmaswa. And according to Manu's law, it cannot be acquired even by the government. Both brahmanas, however, insisted that the cow was theirs and could not be taken back under any condition. Neither of them agreed to the exchange it for the 100,000 cows. Thus, disagreeing with the king's proposal, the two brahmanas left the place in anger, thinking that their lawful possession had been suppressed. After this incident, when the time came for the king to give up his body, he was taken by Yam he was taken before Yamaraj, the superintendent of death, who asked him whether he first wanted to enjoy the results of his pious activities or suffer the results of his impious activities. Seeing that the king had executed so many pious activities and charities, Yamaraj also hinted that he did not know the limit of the king's further enjoyment. In other words, there would be practically no end to the king's material happiness. But in spite of this hint, the king, bewildered, decided first to suffer the results of his impious activities and then to accept the results of his pious activities. Therefore, Yamaraj immediately turned him into a lizard. King Narga had remained in the well as a big lizard for a very long time. He told Lord Krishna, in spite of being put into that degraded condition of life, I simply thought of you, my dear Lord, and my memory was never vanquished. It appears from this statement of King Naga that person who follow the principle of fruitive activities 
and derive some material benefit are not very intelligent. Being given the choice by the superintendent of death, Yamraj, King Narga could have first accepted the result of his pious activities. Instead, he thought it better first to receive the effects of his impious activities and then enjoy the effects of his pious activities. Without disturbance on the whole, he had not developed Krishna consciousness. The Krishna conscious person develops love of God, Krishna not love for the pious or impious activities. Therefore, he is not subjected to the result of such action. As stated in Brahma Samhita, a devotee by the grace of the Lord is not subjected to the reaction of fruitive activities. Somehow or other, as a result of his pious activities, King Nirga had inspired to see the Lord. He continued, My dear Lord, I had a great desire that someday I might be able to see you. Personally, I think that this great desire to see you, combined with my tendency to perform ritualistic and charitable activities, has enabled me to retain the memory of who I was in my former life even though I become a lizard. Such a person who remembers his past life is called Jatismrita, Jatismartha, Jatismara. In modern times also there are instances of small children recalling many details of their past lives. My dear Lord, you are the super soul seated in everyone's heart. There are many great mystic yogis who have the eyes to see you through the Vedas and Upanishads, to achieve the elevated position of realizing that they are equal in equality with you, they always meditate on you within their hearts. But although such exalted saintly persons may see you constantly within their hearts, they still can't see you face to face. Therefore, I am very much surprised that I am able to see you personally. I know that I was engaged in so many activities, especially as a king. Although I was in the midst of luxury and opulence and was subject to so many of the happiness and misery of material existence, I am so fortunate to be seeing you personally. As far as I know, when one becomes liberated from the material existence, he can see you in this way. When King Nrigar elected to receive the results of his impious activities, he was given the body of a lizard because of the mistake in his pious activities. Thus, he could not be directly converted to a higher status of life like a great demigod. However, along with his pious activities, he sought of Krishna. So he was quickly released from the body of a lizard and given the body of a demigod. By worshipping the Supreme Lord, whose, who desire material opulences, are given the bodies of powerful demigods. Sometimes these demigods can see the Supreme Personality of Godhead face to face, but they are still not yet eligible to enter into the spiritual kingdom, the Vaikuntha planets. However, if the demigods continue to be devotees of the Lord, the next chance chance they get, they will enter into the Vaikuntha planets. Having attained the body of a demigod King Nriga, continuing to remember everything said, My dear Lord, you are the Supreme Lord and uh, are worshipped by all the demigods. You are not one of the ordinary living entities. You are the Supreme Person, Purushottam. You are the source of all happiness for all living entities. Therefore, we have accept, no, you are known as Govinda. You are the Lord of those living uh, entities 
who have accepted material bodies and those who have not yet accepted material bodies among the living entities who have not accepted material bodies are those who hover in the material world as evil spirits or life in the ghostly atmosphere however those who live, live in the spiritual king, kingdom the vaikunth lokas have bodies not made of material elements you my lord are infallible you are the supreme the purest of all living entities you live in everyone's heart you are the shelter of all living entities narayana being seated in the heart heart of all living beings you are the supreme director of everyone's sensual activities therefore you are called rishikesh rishikesh my dear supreme lord krishna because you have given me this body of a demigod i will have to go to some heavenly planet so i am taking this opportunity to beg for your mercy i pray that i may have the benediction of never forgetting your lotus feet no matter to which form of life or planet i may be transferred you are all pervading present everywhere as cause and effect you are the cause of all causes and your power is unlimited you are the absolute truth the supreme personality of godhead and the supreme brahman i therefore offer my respectful obeisances onto you again and again my dear lord your body is full of transcendental bliss and knowledge and you are eternal you are the master of all mystic powers therefore you are known as yogeshwara kindly accept me as an insignificant particle of dust at your lotus feet before entering the heavenly planets king nrika circumambulated the lord touched his helmet to the lord's lotus feet and bowed before him seeing the air airplane from the heavenly planets present before him he was given permission by the lord to board it after the departure of king nriga lord krishna expressed his appreciation for the king's devotion to the brahmanas as well as his charitable disposition and his performance of vedic rituals therefore it is recommended that if one cannot directly become a devotee of the lord one should follow the vedic principles of life this will enable him one day to see the lord by being promoted either directly to the spiritual kingdom or indirectly to the heavenly kingdom where he has hope of being transferred to the spiritual planets at this time lord krishna was present among the relatives who were members of kshatriya class to teach them through the exemplary character of king nigra he said even though a kshatriya king may be as powerful as fire it is not possible for him to usurp the property of a brahmana and utilize it for his own purpose if this is so how can ordinary king who falsely thinks themselves the most pow- powerful being within the material world usurp a brahmana's property I don't think that taking poison is as dangerous as taking as a brahmana's property for ordinary poison there is a treatment one can be relieved from its effects but if one drinks the poison of taking a brahmana's property there is no remedy for the mistake the perfect example is king nirga he was very powerful and very pious but due to the small mistake of unknowingly usurping a brahmana's cow he was condemned to the ab- abominable life of a lizard ordinary po- poison affects only those who drink it 
an ordinary fire can be extinguished simply by pouring water on it. But the Arani fire originated in, in, by the spiritual potency of a Brahmana who is dissatisfied can burn to ashes the whole family of a person who provokes such a Brahmana. Formerly, the Brahmanas used to ignite the fire, ignite the fire of a sacrifice not with matches or any other external fire, but with their powerful mantras like Arani. If someone even touches a Brahmana's property, his family is ruined for three generations. However, if a Brahmana's property is forcibly taken away, the taker's family for ten generations before him and then ten generations after will be subjected to reunion. On the other hand, if someone becomes a pure Vaishnava or devotee of the Lord, ten generations of his, of his family before his birth and ten generations after will be liberated. Lord Krishna continued, if some foolish king who is puffed up by his wealth, prestige and power wants to usurp a Brahmana's property, he should be understood to be clearing his path to hell. He does not know how much he has to suffer for such an unwise act. If someone takes away the property of a very liberal brahmana who is encumbered by a large dependent family, then such a usurper is put into the hell known as kumbhipaka. Not only is he put into this hell, but his family members also have to accept such a miserable condition of life. A person who takes away a brahmana's property, whether it was originally given by him or by someone else, is condemned to live for at least 60,000 years as a miserable insect in stool. Therefore, I instruct you, all my boys and relatives present here, do not even by mistake take the possession of a brahmana and thereby pollute your whole family. If someone even wishes to possess such property, let alone attempts to take it away by force, the duration of his life will be reduced. He will be defeated by his enemies and after being bereft of his royal position, when he gives up his body, he will become a serpent, giving trouble to all other living entities. My dear boys and relatives, I therefore advise you that even if a brahmana becomes angry with you and calls you by ill names or curses you, still you should not retaliate. On the contrary, you should smile tolerate him and offer your respects to the brahmana. You know very well that even if I myself offer my obeisances to the brahmanas with great respect three times daily, you should therefore follow my instruction and example. I shall not forgive anyone who does not follow them and I shall punish him. You should learn from the example of King Nigra that even if someone unknowingly usurps the property of a brahmana, he is put into a miserable condition of life. Thus, Lord Krishna, who is always engaged in purifying the conditioned living entity, give instruction not only to his family members and the inhabitants of Dwarka, but to all the members of human society. After this, Lord Krishna entered his palace. Thus end the Bhakti Vedanta purport of 64th chapter, the story of King Narga. Hari 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 Bo, chapter 65. Hari Bo. Lord Balrama became very anxious to see his father and mother in Vrindavan. Chapter 65, Lord Balrama visits Vrindavan. 
Lord Balrama became very anxious to see his father and mother in Vrindavan. Therefore, with great enthusiasm, he started on a chariot for Vrindavan. The inhabitants of Vrindavan had been anxious to see Krishna and Balrama for a very long time. When Lord Balrama returned to Vrindavan, all the coward boys and gopis had grown up. But still, on his arrival, they all embraced him and Balrama embraced them in reciprocation. After this, he came before Maharaj Nanda and Yashoda and offered his respectful obeisances. In response, Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj offered their blessings unto him. They addressed him as Jagadishwara or the Lord of the Universe who maintains everyone. The reason for this was that Krishna and Balrama maintain all living entities and yet Nanda and Yashoda were put into such difficulties on account of their absence. Feeling like this, they embraced Balrama and sitting on him, sitting him on their laps, began their perpetual crying, waiting Balrama with their tears. Lord Balrama then offered his respectful obeisances to the elderly coward men and accepted the obeisances of the younger coward men. Thus, according to their different ages and relationship, Lord Baldrama exchanged feelings of friendship with them. He shook hands with those who were his equals in age and friendship and with loud laughing embraced each one of them. After being received by the car men and boys, the gopis and King Nanda and Yashoda, Lord Balarama sat down, feeling satisfied, and they all surrounded him. First, Lord Balarama inquired from them about their welfare, and then, since they had hadn't seen hadn't seen him for such long time, they began to ask him different questions. The inhabitants of Rindavana had sacrificed sacrificed everything for Krishna, simply being captivated by the lotus eyes of the Lord. Because of their great desire to love Krishna, they never desired anything like elevation to the heavenly planets or merging into the effulgence of Brahman to become one with the absolute truth. They were not even interested in enjoying a life of opulence, but were satisfied in living a simple life in the village as cowherds. They were always absorbed in souls of Krishna and didn't desire any personal benefits. And they were also much in love with him, that in his absence their voices faltered when they began to inquire from Balaramaji. First Nan Maharaj and Yashoda Mai <coughs> require, inquired, My dear Balram, are our friends like Vasudev, sorry, Vasudev and others in the family doing well? Now you and Krishna are grown up, married, men with children. In the happiness of family life, do you sometimes remember your poor father and mother, Nan Maharaj and Yeshoda Devi? It is very good news that the most sinful king, Kansa, has been killed by you and that our friends like Vasudev and the other who had been harassed have now been relieved. It is also very good news that you and Krishna defeated Jarasandha and Kalyavna, who is now dead and that you are no living in a fortified residence in Dwarka. When the gopis arrived, Lord Balram glanced over them with loving eyes. Being overjoyed, the gopis who had so long been mortified on account of Krishna's and Balram's absence began to ask about the welfare of the two brothers. They specifically asked Balram whether Krishna was enjoying his life surrounded by the enlightened women of Dwarka Puri 
Does he sometimes remember his father Nanda and his mother Yashoda and the other friends with whom he so intimately behaved while in Vrindavan? Does Krishna have any plans to come here to see his mother Yashoda? And does he remember us gopis who are now piti pitiably bereft of his company? Krishna may have forgotten us in the midst of the cultured women of Dwarka. But as far as we are concerned, we still remember him by collecting flowers and sewing them into garlands. When he does not come, however, we simply pass our time by crying. If only he would come here and accept these garlands we have made. Dear Lord Balram, descendant of Dasartha, Dasarha, you know that we would give up everything for Krishna's friendship. Even in great distress, one cannot give up the connection of family members. But although it might be impossible for others, we gave up our fathers, mothers, sisters and relatives. But then Krishna, without caring a pinch of our renunciation, all of a sudden renounced us and went away. He broke off our intimate relationship without serious consideration and left for a foreign country. But he was so clever and cunning that he manufactured very nice words. He said, My dear gopis, please do not worry. The service you have rendered me is impossible for me to repay. After all, we are women, so how could we disbelieve him? Now we can understand that his sweet words were, swim were simply for cheating us. Protesting Krishna's absence from Vrindavan, another gopi said, My dear Balramji, we are of course village, village girls, so Krishna could cheat us in that way. But what about the women of Dwarika? Don't think they are as foolish as we are? We village women might be misled by Krishna. But the women in the city of Dwarika are very clever and intelligent. Therefore, I would be surprised if such city women could be misled by Krishna and could believe his words. Then another gopi began to speak. My dear friend, she said, Krishna is very clever in using words. No one, no one can compete him in that art. He can manufacture such colorful words and talk so sweetly that the heart of any woman would be misled. Besides that, he has perfected the art of smiling very attractively and by seeing his smile, women become mad after him and give themselves to him without hesitation. Another gopi, after hearing this, said, my dear friends, what is the use of talking about Krishna? If you are at all interested in passing time by talking, let us talk on some subject other than him. If cruel Krishna can pass his time without us, why can't we pass our time without Krishna? Of course, Krishna is passing his days without us very happily but we cannot pass our days happily without him. When the gopis were talking in this way, their feeling for Krishna became more and more intense, and they were experiencing Krishna's smiling, Krishna's words of love, Krishna's attractive features, Krishna's characters, and Krishna's embrace. By force of their excited feeling, it appeared to them that Krishna was personally present and dancing before them. Because of their sweet remembrance of Krishna, they could not check their tears and they cried without consideration. Lord Balrama, of course, could understand the ecstatic feelings of the gopis and therefore he wanted to pacify them. He was expert in presenting an appeal and thus treating the gopis very respectfully. He began to narrate the stories of Krishna so tactfully that the gopis became satisfied. To keep the gopis in Vrindavan satisfied, 
Lord Balrama stayed there continuously for two months, namely the month of Chaitra, that is March, April, and Vaishag, that is April, May. For those two months, he kept himself among the gopis and he passed every night with them in the forest of Vrindam to satisfy their desire for conjugal love. Thus, Balrama also enjoyed the rasa dance with the gopis during those two months. Since the season was springtime, the breeze of the bank, breeze on the bank of the Yamuna was blowing very mildly, carrying the aroma of different flowers, especially the flower known as Kaumudi. Moonlight filled the sky and spread everywhere, and thus the banks of the Yamuna appeared very bright and pleasing, and Lord Balrama enjoyed the company of the gopis there. The demigod known as Varuna sent his daughter Varuni in the form of liquid honey oozing from the hollows of the trees. Because of this honey the whole forest became aromatic and the sweet aroma of the liquid honey Varuni captivated Balaramaji. Balaramaji and all the gopis became very much attracted by the taste of the Varuni and all of them drank it together. While drinking this natural beverage, all the gopis chanted the glories of Lord Balarama, and the Lord Balarama felt very happy, as if he had become intoxicated by drinking that Varuni beverage. His eyes rolled in a pleasing attitude. He was decorated with long garlands of forest flowers, and the whole situation appeared to be a great function of happiness because of this transcendental bliss. Lord Balarama smiled beautifully and the drops of perspiration decorating his face appeared like soothing morning dew. While Balarama was in the, uh, that happy mood, he desired to enjoy the company of the gopis in the water of the Yamuna. Therefore, he called the Yamuna to come nearby. But the Yamuna neglected the order of Balramji, considering him intoxicated. Lord Balram ordered to uh, sorry, Lord Balram become very much displeased at the Yamuna's neglecting his order. He immediately wanted to scratch the land near the river with his plowshare. Plowshare. Lord Balram has two weapons, a plow and a club, from which he takes service when they are required. This time he wanted to bring the Yamunas by force and he took the help of his plow. He wanted to punish the Yamuna because she did not come in obedience to his order. He addressed the Yamuna, you rest river you did not care for my order now i shall teach you a lesson <laughs> you did not come to me voluntarily now with the help of my plow i shall force you to come i shall divide you into hundreds of scattered stems When the Yamuna was threatened like this, she became greatly afraid of the power of Balram and immediately came in person, falling at his lotus feet and praying thus, My dear Balram, you are the most powerful personality and you are pleasing to everyone. Unfortunately, I forgot your glorious, exalted position. But now I have come to my senses and I remember that you hold all the planetary systems on your head merely by your partial expansion shesha. You are the sustainer of the whole universe. My dear Supreme Personality of Godhead, you are full with six opulences. Because I forgot your omnipotence, I have mistakenly disobeyed your order and thus I have, became, I have become a great offender. But my Lord, 
Dear Lord, please know that I am a soul surrendered unto you who are very affectionate to your devotees. Therefore, please excuse my impudence and mistakes and by your causeless mercy, may you now release me. Upon displaying this submissive attitude, the Yamuna was forgiven. And when she came nearby, Lord Balrama enjoyed the pleasure of swimming in her waters along with the gopis in the same way that an elephant enjoys himself along with his many she-elephants. After a long time, when Lord Balram had enjoyed to his full satisfaction, he came out of the water and immediately a goddess of fortune offered him a nice blue garment and a valuable necklace made of gold. After bathing in the Yamuna, Lord Balram dressed in blue garments and decorated with golden ornaments looked very attractive to everyone. Lord Balram's complexion is white and when he was properly dressed he looked exactly like the white elephant of King Indra in the heavenly planets. The river Yamuna still has many small branches due to being scratched by the plowshare of Lord Balram. And all these branches of the river Yamuna still glorify the omnipotence of Lord Balram. Lord Balrama and the gopis enjoyed transcendental pastimes together every night for two months. And time passed so quickly that all those nights appear to be only one night. In the presence of Lord Balrama, all the gopis and other inhabitants of Vrindavan became as cheerful as they had been before in the presence of both brothers, Lord Krishna and Lord Balrama. Thus ends, ends the Bhakti Vedanta purport of 65th chapter of Krishna, Lord Balrama visits Vrindavan. Hari Bo. So I think we have enough time for one more chapter. Chapter 66, The Deliverance of Pandraka and the King of Kashi. The story of King Pandraka is very interesting because it proves that there have always been many rascals and fools who have considered themselves to be God. Even in the presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, there was such a foolish person. His name was Pandraka, and he wanted to declare himself God. While Lord Balaram was absent in Vrindavan, this King Pandraka, the king of Karusha province, being foolish and puffed up, sent a message to Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is accepted as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But King Pandraka directly challenged Krishna through the messenger who stated that Pandraka, not Krishna, was Vasudeva. In the present day, there are many foolish followers of such rascals. Similarly, in Pandraka's day, many foolish men accepted Pandraka as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because he could not estimate his own position, Pandraka falsely thought himself to be Lord Vasudeva. Thus, the messenger declared to Krishna that King Pandraka, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, had descended to the earth out of his causeless mercy just to deliver all distressed persons. Surrounded by many other foolish persons, this Rasul Pandraka had actually concluded that he was Vasudev, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This kind of conclusion is certainly childish. When children are playing, they sometimes select a king amongst themselves, and the selected child may think that he is actually the king. Similarly, many foolish persons 
due to ignorance select other fool as god and then the rascal actually consider himself god as if god could be created by childish play or by the votes of men under this false impression thinking himself the supreme lord pandrika sent them his messenger to dwarka to challenge the position of krishna the messenger reached the royal assembly of krishna in dwarka and convinced the message given by his master pandrika the message is continued the following statements I am the only supreme personality of godhead vasudeva no man can compete with me i have descended as king pandraka taking compassion on the distressed condition souls out of my unlimited causeless mercy you have falsely taken the position of vasudeva without authority but you should not propagate this false idea you must give up your position o descendant of the yadu dynasty please give up all the symbols of vasudeva which you have falsely assumed and after giving up this position come and surrender unto me if you out of if out of your gross impudence you do not care for my words then i challenge you to fight i am inviting you to a battle in which the decision will be settled when all the members of the royal assembly including king grasena had this message sent by pondraka they laughed very loudly for a considerable time after enjoying the loud laughter of all the members of the assembly krishna replied to the messenger as follows follows o messenger of pondraka you may carry my message to your master You are a foolish rascal. I directly call you a rascal and I refuse to follow your instructions. I shall never give up the symbols of Vasudeva, especially my disk. I shall use this disk to kill not only you but all your followers also. I shall destroy you and your foolish associates who may, may merely constitute a society of cheaters and the cheats cheated. O foolish king you will then have to conceal your face in disgrace and when you when your head is severed from your body by my disk it will be surrounded by meat eaten birds like vultures hawks and eagles at the time instead of becoming my shelter as you have demanded you will be subject to the mercy of these low born birds At the time your body will be thrown to the dogs who will eat it with great pleasure. The messenger carried the words of Lord Krishna to his master Pondrak who patiently heard all these insults without waiting any longer. Lord Shri Krishna immediately started out on his chariot to punish the rascal pondrak the king of karusa because at that time he was living with his friend the king of kashi krishna surrounded the whole city of kashi king pondrak was a great warrior and as soon as he heard of krishna's attack he came out of the city with two akshohini divisions of soldiers the king of kashi also came out with three akshohini divisions when the two kings came before lord krishna to oppose him krishna saw pondrak face to face for the first time krishna saw that pondraka had decorated himself with the symbols of the conch shell disc lotus and club He carried an imitation saranga bow and on his chest was a mock insignia of Srivatsa. His neck was decorated with a false kasuba jewel and he wore a flower garland in exact imitation of Lord Vasudev's. 
He was dressed in yellow silken garments and the flag on his chariot carried the symbol of Garuda, exactly imitating Krishna's. He had a very valuable helmet on his head and his earrings like swordfish glittered brilliantly. On the whole, however, his dress and makeup were clearly imitation. Anyone could understand that he was just like someone on stage playing the part of Vasudev in false dress. When Lord Sri Krishna saw Pondrak imitating his posture and dress, he could not check his laughter and thus he laughed with great satisfaction. The soldiers on the side of King Pondraka began to shower their weapons upon Krishna. The weapons including various kinds of tridents, clubs, poles, lances, swords, daggers and arrows came flying in waves and Krishna counteracted them. He smashed not only the weapons but also the soldiers and assistants of Pondraka. Just as during the dissolution of this universe the fire of devastation burns everything to ashes, the elephants, chariots, horses and infantry belonging to the opposite party were scattered by the weapons of Krishna. Indeed, the whole battlefield became strewn with smashed chariots and the bodies of men and animals. There were fallen horses, elephants, men, asses and camels. Although the devastated battlefield appeared, Like the dancing place of Lord Shiva at the time of dissolution of the world, the warriors on the side of Krishna were very much encouraged by seeing this and they fought with greater strength. At, <coughs> at this time, Lord Krishna told Pandurakha, Pandurakha, you requested me to give up the symbols of Lord Vishnu, specifically my disc. Now I will give you up, give it up to you. Be careful. You, false, you falsely declare yourself Vasudeva, imitating me. Therefore, no one is a greater fool than you. From this statement of Krishna, it is clear that any rascal who advertises himself as God is the greatest fool in the human society. Krishna continued, now, Ponduraka, I shall force you to give up this false representation. You wanted me to surrender on to you. Now this is your opportunity. We shall now fight. And I, if I am defeated by, and you are victorious, I shall certainly surrender on to you. In this way, after chastising Panduraka very severely, Krishna smashed Panduraka's chariot to pieces by shooting an arrow. Then with the help of his disc, he separated Panduraka's head from his body, just as Indra shaves off the peak of mountains by striking them with his thunderbolt. Similarly, Krishna also killed the king of Kashi with his arrows. Lord Krishna specifically arranged to throw the head of king Ka of Kashi into the city of Kashi itself so that this hit, so that his relatives and family members could see it krishna did just this just as a hurricane carries a lotus petal here and there lord krishna killed panduraka and his friend kashi raja on the battlefield and then he returned to his capital city dwarka when Lord Krishna returned to the city of Dwarka, all the cities from the heavenly planets were singing his glories. As far as Pandraka was concerned, somehow or another he always thought of Lord Vasudev by falsely dressing himself to imitation of the Lord. Therefore, Pandraka achieved Sarupya, one of the five kinds of liberation and was thus promoted to the Vaikuntha planets, where the devotees have the same bodily features as Vishnu, 
with four hands holding the four symbols. Factually, his meditation was concentrated on the Vishnu form, but because he thought himself Lord Vishnu, it was offensive. By his being killed by Krishna, however, that offense was mitigated. Thus he was given Sarupya liberation, and he attained the same form as the Lord. When the head of King of Kasi was thrown through the city gate, people gathered and were astonished to see wonderful thing. When they found out that there were hearing on it, they could understand it was someone's head. They counted as to whose head it might be. Some thought it was the King Krishna's head because Krishna was the enemy of Kasi Raj and they calculated that the king of Kasi might have thrown Krishna's head into the city so that people might take pleasure in the enemies having been killed. But they finally detect that the head was not Krishna but that of Kasi Raj himself. When this was assisted, the queens of King of Kasi immediately approached and began to lament the death of their husband. Our dear Lord, they cried upon your death. We have become just like uh, dead bodies. The king of Kashi had a son whose name was Sudakshina. After observing the ritualistic funeral ceremonies, he took a vow that since Krishna was the enemy of his, enemy of his father, he would kill Krishna and in this way liquidate his debt to his father. Therefore, accompanied by a learned priest qualified to help him, he began to worship Mahadeva, Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva, who is also known as Vishwanath, is the lord of the kingdom of Kashi. The temple of Lord Vishwanath is still existing in Varanasi and many thousands of pilgrims still gather daily in that temple. By the worship of Sudakshina, the Lord Shiva was very much pleased and he wanted to give a benediction to his devotee. Sudakshina's purpose was to kill Krishna and therefore he prayed for a specific power by which to kill him. Lord Shiva advised that Sudakshina, assisted by the Brahmanas, execute the ritualistic ceremony for the killing one's enemy. This ceremony is also mentioned in some of the tantras. Lord Shiva informed Sudakshina that if such a black ritualistic ceremony were performed properly, then the evil spirit named Dakshinagni would appear and they carry out any order given to him. He would have to be employed, however, to kill someone other than a qualified Brahmana. If all these conditions were met, then Dakshin Agni, accompanied by Lord Shiva's ghostly companions, would fulfill the desire of Sudakshina to kill his enemy. When, when Sudakshina was encouraged by Lord Shiva in that way, he was sure that he would be able to kill Krishna. With a determined row of austerity, he began to execute the black art of chanting mantras, assisted by the priests. After this, out of the fire came a great de demonic form, whose hair, beard and mustache were exactly the color of hot copper. This form was very big and fierce. As the demon arose from the fire, cinders of fire emanated from the sockets of his eyes. The giant fiery demon appeared still more fierce due to the movements of his eyebrows. He exhibited long sharp teeth and sticking out his long tongue licked his upper and lower lips. He was naked and he carried a big trident blazing like fire. After appearing from the fire of sacrifice, he stood wielding the trident in his hand. 
instigated by Sudakshina, the demon proceeded towards the capital city Dwaraka with many hundreds of ghostly companions. And it appeared that he was going to burn all outer space to ashes. The surface of the ash trembled because of his striking steps. When he entered the city of Dwaraka, all the residents panicked, just like animals in a forest fire. At that time, Krishna was playing chess in the Royal Assembly, Council Hall. All the residents of Dwarka approached and addressed him, Dear Lord of the Three Words, A great uh, fairy demon is ready to burn the whole city of Dwarka. Please save us. In this way, all the inhabitants of Dwarka appealed to Lord Krishna for protection from the fairy demon, who had just appeared in Dwarka to, to uh, devastate the whole city. Lord Krishna, who specifically protects his devotees, saw that the whole population of Dwarka was much perturbed by the presence of the great fiery demon. He immediately smiled and assured them, Don't worry, I shall give you all protection. The Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna is all-pervading. He is within everyone's heart and he is also without in the form of the cosmic manifestation. He could understand that the fiery demon was a creation of Lord Shiva and in order to vanquish the demon he took his Sudarshana Chakra and ordered him to take the necessary steps. The Sudarshana Chakra appeared with the effulgence of millions of suns, his heat being as powerful as the fire created at the end of the cosmic manifestation. By his effulgence, the Sudarshan Chakra illuminated the entire universe, on the surface of the earth as well as in outer space. Then the Sudarshan Chakra began to freeze the fiery demon created by Lord Shiva. In this way, the fiery demon was checked by the Sudarshan Chakra of Lord Krishna and being defeated in his attempt to devastate the city of Dwarka, he turned back. Having failed to set fire to Dwaraka, the fiery demon went back to Varanasi, the kingdom, the kingdom of Kashiraj. As a result of his return, all the priests who had helped instruct the black, black art of mantras along with their employer Sudakshina were burned to ashes by the glaring effulgence of the fiery demon. According to the methods of black art mantras instructed in the tantras, if the mantra fails to kill the enemy, then because it must kill someone, it kills the original creator. Sudakshina was the originator and the priest assisted him. Therefore, all of them were burned to ashes. This is the way of the demons. The demons create something to kill God, but by the same weapon, the demons themselves are killed. Following just behind the fiery demons, the Sudarshana Chakra also entered Varanasi. This city had been very opulent and great for a long, very, for a very long time. Even now, the city of Varanasi is opulent and famous, and it is in one of the important cities of India. There were then many big palaces, assembly houses, marketplaces, and gates with large and very important, important monuments by the palaces and gates. Lecturing platform could be found at each and every crossroad. There were buildings that housed the treasury, elephants, horses, chariots and grains and palaces for distribution of food. 
and places for distribution of food. The city of Varanasi had been filled with all these material opulences for a very long time, but because of the king of Kasi and his son Sudakshina were against Lord Krishna, the Vishnu Chakra Sudarshana, the disc weapon of Lord Krishna, devastated the whole city by burning all these important places. This ex excursion was more rav ravaging than modern bombing. The Sudarshna Chakra, having thus finished this, his duty, came back to his lord, Shri Krishna at Dwarka. This narration of the devastation of Varanasi by Krishna's disc weapon, the Sudarshan Chakra, is transcendental and auspicious. Anyone who narrates or hears this story with faith and attention will be released from all reaction to sinful activities. This is the assurance of Shukadeva Goswami who narrated this story to Parikshit Maharaj. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purports of the 66th chapter of Krishna, the deliverance of Pandraka and the king of Kashi. Hari So that concludes our one hour reading of Krishna book to Srila Prabhupada here in his Vrindavan house. Srila Prabhupada, we'd like to thank you for allowing us to come and read to you. And as we always do, let us offer our respectful obeisances to Srila Prabhupada and to each other. Nama Om Vishnu Madaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharane Nirvasesha Sunyavadi Paskajadi Shatarane To each other Vancha Kalpatrubhischa Kripa Sindhu Vyevacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha So today is also, uh, you might note, the disappearance of our dear Jamuna Devi the uh, wonderful devotee Vaishnavi who was one of Prabhupada's earliest disciples and she's also the one who sings the Govindam prayers every morning to greet the deities. So right now if you go into the conference room there's some uh, devotees there and they're giving her, her memories, his, their memories of her and you can also go online uh, on Iskhan Vrindavan or YouTube and you can hear the memories of our dear Jamuna Devi. Uh, today we also did a Pushpanjali at her Samadhi at the Vaishnavi, Vaishnav uh, Samadhi area at the Goshala, so you can go there and uh, pray to her that we also become, um, give a life of unalloyed devotion. That was what she was known for, unalloyed devotion to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna.